Hey everybody, this edition of Lineheart Radio is brought to you by the world's first creatine coffee. Each scoop is a full cup of a Colombian Arabica bean coffee infused with five grams of a creatine monohydrate. Now here's the deal, guys. A lot of people have differing opinions about creatine, and unfortunately a lot of really shitty supplement companies have tried to sell it to kids that want to get big and they package it as some kind of steroid alternative and they tell you if you cycle it and if you stack it then you'll gain a bunch of muscle mass and at the end of the day none of that is true what is true is that it's one of the most studied and beneficial supplements on the market for strength recovery and endurance so whether you're a runner whether you are a strength athlete Uh, or whether you're somebody that wants to enhance cognitive function and just feel healthier in everyday life, a pharmaceutical-grade creatine monohydrate is going to help get you there. Go to www.creatinecoffee.com to learn what all the hype is about. And now, on to the show. Welcome back to Lionheart Radio. I'm your host, Rick Alexander, founder of Lou Aviv, based in San Diego, California. And I'm here with Claudia. Hi guys, Claudia Challoner, Doctor of Physical Therapy and Nationally Ranked Powerlifter. And we have a very special guest today, Dr. Megan Helwig. Uh, she's a Doctor of Physical Therapy and owner of Primal Strength. She is a former Division I athlete, a triathlete, and now CrossFitter. Hi guys. So today we're recording inside of a gym, kind of. So it might be a little bit echoey and you might hear some barbells. Uh, drop it in the background, just ignore it, it just makes it all more real. <laughs> so you got your background in Division One field hockey? Yes. So do you want to kind of take us back from the beginning? Like where did your sports journey kind of begin? Um, it actually kind of began when I was born. Uh, my dad was a professional golfer and um, from as early as I can remember, my whole family, I'm the oldest of five kids, we all were active in sports, swimming, field hockey, golf. I played competitive golf all through high school, swam competitively through high school, and then ended up taking scholarship to play field hockey in college. So that's kind of how it started. Oh, nice. And you played, you were a field hockey goalie? I was. So I was a goalie at Villanova. Oh, nice. Is, all right, you know, I might be wrong here, but is field hockey the second biggest sport in the world? Have you heard that before? Behind soccer? It, okay. Yeah. It might, it, there's a men's sport. So it's, it's a like men's a men's sport. sport, like, and it's huge in the Olympics yeah. and stuff. Yeah. The U.S. team, like, you have to see how we all rank, but usually, like, playing against some of the men. Yeah. Holy crap. So, did the U.S., do we have a men's team? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we're in the Olympics. Or we don't make it. <laughs> I don't know how far along we go. I don't want to offend them. I don't know. I should know. <laughs> gotcha. But, no, there's a lot, a lot of, um, we had a guy in high school that came over internationally, and that's all he played, and we wanted him to play so bad, but everyone, like, made fun of him. But he was, like, amazing. Oh, really? But it's a huge sport overseas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you originally got, you, you were going for finance mm-hmm. originally, and then, so how did you decide, because now you are a doctor of physical therapy, so how did you decide to kind of make that switch? So I was working in New York City actually for a couple of years post-graduation, um, I graduated in 03, and I was training for a half Ironman triathlon, and I could not run getting off the bike, and I was only like a month out from, it was Eagle Man in Maryland. And I could not run getting off the bike. My knee kept locking. And one of the girls that I swam with was like, oh, go over and see this guy. He does ART. He'll fix you up. And that was kind of um, my first experience with, well, at least ART and kind of rehab. And I was like, I like this so much more than sitting at a desk all day. I was like, I cannot deal with, you know, sitting still. That was so not my personality. Um, And that kind of got me thinking, do I want to go back? Like PT, Cairo, PA. And then I even thought like maybe be a teacher so I could be off and train and have like you know, the schedule that I could do both. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I ended up going back, but I only took bio for the business major. So that was my only science. So I had to go back and do like a year, two years of all the sciences to even (laughs) go, even apply for PT school. So what was your undergrad, Claudia? Well, I I studied exercise science. I had a bachelor of science, but I had taken a few years off to personal train. So some of my classes had already ex- expired mm-hmm. before PT school, so I had to retake anatomy and physiology, and I had to take some chemistries too. So, and of course, they're like chemistry one and two, so you have to take a year <laughs> to do that. Yes. So yeah, all yeah. that stuff that I'm never going to use again. No. Ever. Exactly. 
And so how did the story end? You got, you went to the physio, right? And then you, he worked on you, you were good. I, when I was you... working in the city, but it was like one of those like glamorous outpatient, like all pro athletes there. I'm like, oh, this is what I want to do. <laughs> Not knowing that like, yes, I still had to do an acute care in the hospital rotation, like nursing home, all this other stuff. Like there were so many other aspects of that, but mm -hmm. being an athlete, like I kind of knew the niche I wanted to be in. So that's kind of how it started. And then luckily the company I was with in New York, I had an office in New Jersey. That's where I was living at the time on the East Coast. And they let me transfer um, there while I went back to school at night to finish all the courses. So then I started back in 2006 with PT school. Nice. And so, but when he, but you were able to like work through the knee injury? I think I only saw him like three or four sessions. And then I did the whole half Ironman with no pain. Really? Um, so I knew like ART, active release technique, was one of the techniques I wanted to get certified in right when, and I, I my first course I took when I was still a student because you got like a discount as a student to take it. So I had started that and that's like, just because it worked on me and I was a believer in it, you yeah. know, that was one of the first techniques and then I kind of, kind of built from there. Do you have to be a PT to get certified in ART? I think you have to be either a PT, Cairo, a licensed massage therapist or a um, athletic trainer. Okay, so yeah. do you um, do you mostly work with endurance athletes because that's kind of how you got your start? Or I had a big mix. For seven years, I was working at a ortho sports clinic in New Jersey that was affiliated with the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we did see a lot of post surgical. So it was like a big mix. And since we were part of the hospital, we also had the Medicare and also like charity care. We we saw a little bit of everything, mm -hmm. but we were attached to like a speed school. Yep. And then mm -hmm. we also had a, a tri team within our group. So oh, cool. we kind of saw a little bit of everything. And then I had for a little bit, I branched out on my own, and I was at um, Baldestrol uh, Golf Club. Which was uh, and doing golf performance. Okay. So. Golf must be a PT yes. haven, huh? It is. Yeah. <laughs> All that twisting. Because <laughs> you're, you're doing a bit of golf work now, right? I do. I actually was just, just in Santa Barbara? I was up in Santa Barbara this weekend up at Donna Parsons Golf Instruction. Okay. So I go up there once a month and like Friday I'll see a bunch of the clients one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll talk to the pros and see what they're working on in their golf swing. Like one of the girls is having trouble transferring her weight and can't get over onto her left leg or one's not rotating well. And then I do like my one-on-one -on -one assessment, breaking down the body to see why mm -hmm. they're having trouble. Yep. So then like trying to fix those things and then send them back out with the golf pro to work on their swing and see if now they can get into those positions that they were having trouble with before. With something like golf, do you find that when an athlete, uh, in their sport, they do a lot of rotation, and then do you actually prescribe them training as well? Because if, even if you fix their problem, then they go back to working out all in like one plane of motion, they're still kind of set up to, for failure, do you think, or? Um, I think all like any function, like I basically prescribe, like I'm looking at functional movement patterns mm -hmm. and giving them movement patterns that either simulate what they're trying to get into, yep. correcting any kind of dysfunction. Cause I always say any good athlete's a good compensator. We're great at cheating. If we have a little bit of pain, we'll just move differently. Right, right. So we don't feel it. Yeah. So I think a lot of the stuff I give them, um, is just to reinforce those patterns. Um, once we identify like the relationships, mm. so so, um, and then, so you got, you said you went and got your ART. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think like for me has come in handy a lot when I'm lifting, right? Cause a lot of joints just, uh, they help like i found the ART helps to open up that, that joint. What about endurance? Do endurance athletes, could they benefit from ART? So we uh, ART is actually branded with Ironman. Um, so for five years, I would go up to Ironman Lake Placid. Um, cause that's, I was on the East coast living in New Jersey and, um, we would work on the athletes like they would just line up and we would be there for like however many hours and you were just seeing like we there was one day we saw probably 200 athletes between like all of us in the tent um and it's just art that's mm -hmm. all we're doing on them because we're there just with art yeah. um and you're up there for the week so and they were they respond really well and a lot of like the like iron man whatever like when you get to that level with certain things like they're in tune with their body they know what they're feeling like a lot of times some of them will come up to you and be like here's a list from my art provider that i would see at home this is what they normally do can you do this on me you is know? that easier for you like do you like that or is that like when someone googles all their symptoms and then goes to the doctor and they're like this is what so i, I in, the, in those kind of settings you're not really able to evaluate anyone so it, if you kind of have a, a short list of maybe what works for them it kind of helps you in like a almost like a wham-bam kind of situation yeah. versus oh. like 
if someone was coming to see you, you don't really want. Yeah, because you don't have a lot of time. Like, it goes against how I, like, ethically, like, how I treat. Because, like, people come in and, like, it hurts here. I'm like, well, that's probably not the problem. Yes, it might hurt there, but that's just a symptom of something else in your body going on. Um, So, in the beginning, like, years ago, I used ART, like, all the time. Like, this hurt, I was working on all that stuff. And now I've found, like, combining it with, like, ART is just a tool in my toolbox Mm -hmm. of the other stuff I use. And it's actually saved my hands a ton not having to do it all over the place. Because if I can, like, fine-tune what the actual problem is and the why behind that hurts, like, why is it hurt? Why is it tight? I sometimes don't even have to touch it. And you release something else and the pain there will go away. Because that was actually working too hard for something that wasn't working. So mm. if you can get something that like wasn't working to come back online and retrain, it's all motor control in the brain, like telling the brain's what tells everything to, right, to right. move. So if you can actually reprogram that, then it like it saves well it saves me a lot and it also saves them a lot of their time because you can fix things a lot faster. Mm. Yeah, I think I've talked about this on podcast on a podcast before, but when I originally started training for ultras and I was like, oh, I have shin splints. And then I went to a girl with ART uh, or a girl who was um, had ART in her toolbox as well. And she was like, did a bunch of work on my feet. And I was like, no, I don't have shin splints. <laughs> so I yeah. guess I didn't have shin splints at all. Mm-hmm. And really it was my, I think my arches were so tight that it was like, like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Don't like something, like no, like shin splints, if they're on the front, mm-hmm. you work on the back, and all of a sudden the front pain goes away. Right. You know, like that front to back relationship, like agonist antagonist yeah. uh, stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I have stuff now where I'm working on people's scars yeah. um, and scars from years ago, but you cut yourself, or even if like you go in for surgery and they're going in to fix something, mm-hmm. your body still senses trauma. Your body still senses, like, hey, you're cutting into me. That's like, what are you doing? So your body's going to react and protect itself. So I work on, now I find if I correct the scars first, the muscles will go back online. Like sometimes I don't even have to test, like I'll muscle test someone and things will test weak and I just correct the scar and then everything else tests strong again. And I didn't even have to do any like strengthening. Like they tested weak and then all of a sudden they test strong by just correcting some scar work. You know, Mm. it's more of the brain. It wasn't that it was weak. It was just a signal to the brain was being intercepted by something else that was guarding or protecting itself. And is that where the neurokinetic... That's where I learned that with NKT and then a combination of like, you know, kind of putting it all together, just looking how the movement pattern is. But a lot of the stuff I use is the NKT, like the muscle testing. So uh, for the listeners and for me, (laughs) what, what is NKT? So NKT stands for neurokinetic therapy. Basically, it's, you know, muscle testing, Uh but you're muscle testing to look for that neural input to see if the brain registers. Like when you test, say you're testing the glute max, is the glute max actually kicking in right away? Mm -hmm. Like depending on how you test, and we say sometimes the better the athlete, the lighter I'll test because they're Mm -hmm. better at compensating or pulling something in to help cheat or compensate. Okay. So, um, you know, you can test it for like endurance, you can test it for strength, you can test it just for like sometimes super light just to see if it kicks in. And if it doesn't, but then I'll ask like, the history is a huge thing. Like if I know you had a certain scar or a certain thing and um, something's not really firing, I might just touch that scar while I test it. Or even before I do that, I'll muscle test everything, see what's on, what's off, and then I'll go test the scar to itself. Like, when you say scar, what are you talking about? Like an actual scar? Like an actual scar. Okay. Yeah. Like it could be like an like, actual yeah. physical scar, maybe like... Like, like a C-section. Like a C-section okay. too. Like or like that, yeah. a lot of times like women won't even remember like if they had a kid, if they actually tore. Like when they gave birth. Yeah. They had, and that's, that's scarring. So sometimes I'll have them, and I'm not having them go under their pants, but like right. over their pants, put their finger where the scar was, and then muscle test, and it changes the testing. Okay. And then when you say muscle test, what are the parameters that you're looking for? Are you looking for a uh, muscular response to an electronic sin- signal? Or? So like when I'm asking them to like hold their leg in this position and then I'm like resisting it to see, and like the way I hold it, the way the body's angled, all that will all dictate which muscle I'm testing and what like alignment I put the, the client in. Okay. When I test, will like kind of dictate where I'm testing in their body. Um, or like I'll have them in standing and I'll test patterns, like trying to twist them or trying to push them over one way, trying to push them sideways to see mm. if they could stabilize. So like I'll test patterns and then I'll also test muscle or even ligaments. Like you can test ligaments or you can test tendons, um, but you have to use, we call it like an indicator muscle. So I use another muscle somewhere in the body that I know responds properly. Mm -hmm. Um, and use that while touching in certain ways, a ligament or a tendon or a scar. Yeah. To see if the signal's there. Interesting. Is NKT new or has this been around for a long time? I think I took the first one, maybe like five, 
five or six years ago. Okay. I um, mean, it's kind of like grown a lot since then where like well, I took one of the original ones and then it's changed and there's like a level two, there's a level three okay. now. So there's different levels of it. Yep. Um, now they're starting to break out. They're actually going to start an equine, um, oh, I wow. think, and a pelvic okay. floor to different segments. Okay. Okay. Stuff. Because they actually were doing with surrogate testing on animals, oh, which is really cool. Oh, even created mm-hmm. an equine mm-hmm. taping course. Yeah. <laughs> what can- can you bring that down? 57 education We're both into horses. Okay. <laughs> so before I wanted to be a PT, equine, I actually, horses. yeah. Okay. So my whole life growing up, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Okay. I, I don't like reptiles, but I was like, if I can do everything but reptiles, <laughs> and that was going to happen. Um, and then I actually thought about becoming, like, doing equine and canine PT, but in New Jersey mm-hmm. back in, like, mm-hmm. 04, 05, I think when I was looking, um, you had to be a vet tech or a veterinarian. Like, PTs couldn't do the equine. Yeah. Um, stuff. So I was like, oh. In this narrow kinetic. I was like, fine, I'll do with people. Therapy? Is that NKT? NKT. And I they think do this with horses. That's something new. Yeah. I don't know if it's out yet, but I know they're they were developing. Um, oh, okay. Of There's course. a lot of things that they do that cross over from physical therapy to like horse therapy and and even dogs. Like, really? I mean, there's physical therapy for. Yeah. yeah, they have the treadmills, they have the underwater treadmills, they do like yeah. the rock tape and stuff like that. Yeah. And like when I took my first kinesio tape course in like 09, I think, there was two trainers there that were the horse trainers and the tape worked better on horses than it did on humans. Like a horse that couldn't jump and they would just tape the horse and the horse could jump. I know, it sounds crazy. I don't know if you're fucking with me right now. No, <laughs> totally. It's, it's totally. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. So, Rock Tape, the company that we all know in yes. CrossFit and different sports, yeah. they do, they tape mm-hmm. up horses. Yeah. And that's a legit thing. Yeah. Legit. There's a course actually uh, later this month. I was going to go to it, but it was kind of expensive. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Where and is it? We should just kind of like. It's in Bakersfield. Who, who <laughs> is more uh, cutting edge, humans or the horses? Uh, like as far as therapy, like do, are they doing things on horses that are ahead of what we do on humans? Or is it comparable? Um, do you even know? I wouldn't. Even, I don't really yeah, know. I'm I feel like. Sure. I, I don't know. I, th- I think some things might work better on horses because they don't overthink things like humans do. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I. Don't I don't know if they come up with all the excuses or the. Uh, uh, the thinking, basically, yeah. of all this yeah. stuff, yeah, like, yeah. overanalyzing everything. Because yeah. mm-hmm. a lot of that stuff, too, like, you start thinking about even just certain injuries and stuff, a lot of it has emotional components to it. Or, like, what where you hold sense. your stress, um, past trauma. Yeah. They're, like, there's a huge thing now, some, like, trauma release stuff, doing all these other things that, like, you don't realize you're holding this tension in your body, and it's your subconscious. Mm-hmm. Like, part of the thing that I like to do, and I think we talk about it in SFMA and some of the other techniques, like uh, like Greg Cook and the selective mm-hmm. FMS and SFMA. Yeah, that's the functional movement screening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, basically, it's, like, our, when you come in with pain, yep. like, you're, like, it hurts here, but like say pointing at their elbow or something yep. it might not actually be the elbow but the client thinks my elbow hurts the pain's here mm-hmm. so then it's my job to go in and do the assessment to bring it to their consciousness being like look this is like the dysfunctional patterns I'm finding this is the true cause the pain here is only a symptom so once the patient can understand that in their con- like bring it to their consciousness that that might not be the actual cause mm-hmm. then they have a chance to start correcting things and then eventually like you can do some soft tissue work whatever it may be or whatever techniques you use to correct it and then give them movement patterns and then they can do the movement patterns and maybe it takes effort so that's still like more conscious like effort but then eventually if they do it enough it becomes subconscious again so now they have like a functional subconscious pattern whereas in the beginning it was a dysfunctional pattern where now we can retrain it back to yeah so it's like you almost like in when i was in school and like all the neuro stuff i'm like i don't know if i want to do neuro but blah, neuro blah. Is ortho. But now that's all it is that yeah. is everything like it that's totally how right. we work it's yeah. crazy you wouldn't think of it that way but now like it brings you right back to it yeah i feel like the idea that something can cause emotional trauma and manifest in physical pain is is like new or or it's like becoming i'm at least just starting to hear about it more uh, well, I think they're probably, they're doing more research on it and becoming more aware of certain things. But, yeah. I mean, there's a huge component on, you know, stress and and all of these other components in your life and how they can affect inflammatory responses and, you know, injuries, yeah. previous injuries that you've had or maybe a current one. Or like right? the- 
Yeah. Like the biggest thing I talk about with every single client now is breathing. Like, so we don't even think like when we're born, that's the first thing we do. And like, we should have normal breathing pattern. But if you ask someone to do like a belly breath or breathe, some people have no clue. And they're like, <sighs> like breathing all from their chest and their shoulders yeah, lifting their shoulders. and yeah. they don't realize it and they don't know how to breathe from here. Mm -hmm. But then you ask maybe their history and maybe they did have asthma. So it could have been just like they had trouble breathing. So they would try to breathe more. But if they had like an anxiety or a panic disorder, or they had a lot of like, you know, trauma or stress at home and they were super scared all the time or fearful, um, that will change their breathing pattern or even just like an abdominal surgery. Like they had their appendix taken out as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, you have that scar there. You don't want to breathe from your belly cause it hurts. So you guard that area and then all of a sudden you just developed a new pattern. So you compensated, mm -hmm. but your diaphragm's attached to like, it's attached to everything, like your spine, your ribs, your core, like your pelvic floor, all that stuff. So if the breathing's off, all that other stuff's off. So we don't realize that like, breathing alone can change so much yeah. but that goes back to like just retraining that and the brain mm -hmm. can reset like so much stuff so like the past few years with all this stuff it's kind of changed how I you know think about things and even how I treat like even just from ortho sports to you know every day right. you know people with pain yeah so this might be a little esoteric but I'm gonna put it out there anyway have you ever heard of somebody breathing into where it hurts in order to reduce pain do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever heard of that before? No. Okay, then I'm not gonna bring it up because I can't. I don't understand that. Enough. <laughs> when, when, Later episode. Yeah. When when you are uh, when you are doing a functional movement screening on somebody though, how are you ruling out physical pain, like trauma versus emotional, in order to figure out what's really going on? Like, how, what's your process to, or how can people figure that out for themselves even? I mean, there's a lot of sub, like sometimes people just avoid a lot of stuff in their life. They don't want to think about it because, you know, it's going to bring up other stuff. But like I had a client in the past couple months and I was working on her and just something didn't seem right. Like I just had that feeling like I needed to like dig deeper on her, like about history and stuff. And that's sometimes like a, you have to make sure you feel like that they trust you in sure. um, that relationship. And I was like, do you have any other scars maybe that you're not telling me about? Like, not, I didn't say it that you're not telling me about. I'm like, maybe is there any other scars or surgeries you had that like maybe you didn't remember? She's like, well, there was one and it was huge. She was, she had a hysterectomy at a young age. Yeah. And, but she's like, but that scar healed so well, you can't even see it. And like when we looked for the scar, I could hardly even see where it was. But when I started to do, I was like, can I ask to touch it? Cause I needed to use it for testing. Um, I just got this weird like sense and when I was working with her I started to get super emotional and I was like uh, like so and then, and then I stopped and I was like because if you kind of cross that line where they go we call it like going limbic like their limbic system like emotional all it's going to bring up all this stuff mm -hmm. um, I, I asked her I was like did you have a lot of emotional trauma or stuff go on with that surgery and of course because she couldn't that was how she felt she couldn't have kids right. um, so I was like is this something you want to deal with um, is this something that maybe you've dealt with when you had that surgery, like maybe if you needed to go to therapy, if you needed to talk to someone about it. And she's like, no, yes. She's like, if it's affecting my golf game, um, we're going to fix it. You know, I'm ready to fix it. Right, right. I'm like, okay. I was like, I just wanted to check and make sure. She's like, no, I'm ready. You know, but it's something where I got like, um, I almost got like super emotional when I was working on her mm -hmm. and I could feel it and I had to back off because I knew there was some weird energy going on. Um, and maybe my first couple of years out of school, like, I don't know if I would have felt that, yeah. but as you start to work and you get comfortable and like touch and you can kind of feel where there's tension in the body, like you can start to feel it. And I felt it right away. Yeah. Um, and she almost started crying because she's like, no one's ever like found that kind of connection. But when we went in on that scar, it changed everything. And now she's been like ecstatic because now she can actually transfer her weight and get her weight through and rotate in her golf swing, which she was getting lessons for years. And she was getting better, but she was getting stuck all the time. Mm. But it was like one of those things where it was like a, you know, a fine line. We had to walk to make sure we didn't go too far too fast. Yeah. But we never know like a simple little scar, what really the profound impact that surgery meant, like had emotionally on the person. Right. Like what else went into it other than just, you know, having that surgery. Yeah. But just even injury in general, like it has an, a huge emotional connection with it you know whether it's an athlete or mm -hmm. you know like especially down the street especially for athletes yeah because it's like our it identity takes us out of what we love and like our life 
and, mm-hmm. and we don't know what to do. Especially if we, if we use that, that sport as like, to, not as like a coping mechanism, but if we use that as like our outlet. Yeah. Like yeah. that's like our outlet. That's yeah, how we're like, identity. that's like our happy place. That's where we go when we want to like really stress. That's where we go when we want to like, you know, so many different things. And then all of a sudden that's taken away from you because of an injury. Like it has so many, like it affects you in so many aspects of your life, but then it can actually physically affect you and how you move and your movement patterns. And if you don't clear them up, maybe that little pain goes away. Years down the line, all of a sudden you're like, I have this other pain that came out of nowhere. Like so often I find when people have pain that comes out of nowhere, it's actually something that they were compensating or some pattern that they've developed over the years that finally the tissue's like, I can't handle this pattern anymore, I'm breaking down. Mm. So it's been interesting to see like some of the emotional and different stuff coming up and just different patterns. Like it's almost like you take one layer away and then like other stuff comes up. You take another layer away and you're like, oh, I haven't had this in years, but it's because you just took away all the compensations that they built around that. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of the reason, like just for anybody listening to this, why you, you know, why you should go see a PT is that they have reps looking at all of these different things. And obviously I'm preaching to the choir here with you guys. (laughs) But like, you know, even for myself, I feel like I'm really in tune with like, myself as an athlete my training and everything but you know I thought I had shin splints I go to this girl for like two seconds and she sees exactly what's happening yeah it's always good to have someone else's even if you know a lot about like yourself even physical therapists like we have to get our own treatment too like you have to have other people's eyes on you to be Mm -hmm. able to you know plug out some of these deficiencies or dysfunctions well it's just like even having a coach right like that objective view that's yeah. nuts outside of your situation. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. you know. we can't test ourselves. Like, so no, often I'm like, I wish I could just test myself right now, and I can't. Right. Yeah. yeah. See, so everyone, everyone needs that. So mm-hmm. it's important. But also seeing a physical therapist that understands where you are, like, if you are an athlete or something like that. Like, you need right. to be able to be able to communicate with someone that understands, like, where you're coming from. Cause we're not going to say, okay, don't do it and go rest for like four weeks. Yeah. You know, that's the last thing. Because if someone told me don't do not do it and just go rest, I'm like, well, what's the point? I'm going to go rest and I'm just going to go back to the same movement patterns. Right. Anyway, yeah. like, yeah, there may be a case where we've done, like, there's trauma where it actually has to rest. Like, that might actually be the case. But most often, mm-hmm. like, if you can yeah. catch it before then, like, that's why I'd rather see people before it gets really bad or before it's a big traumatic injury. Mm-hmm. You know, when you start to feel mm-hmm. things that are a little funky, you know, clean that stuff up and you're just never going to get to the point mm-hmm. then where hopefully you're out of commission for a little while. Like, because I've gone through that. I've shattered my clavicle. I've, I've gotten hit by a car training on my bike and, like, torn, you know, a bunch of stuff. And that was, like, the hardest time is when you couldn't train. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's a mental test. You know, you go through like the phases, like the morning, like, like yeah. at first, like you're so mad and depressed, like totally. right after the surgery, I'm like in the sling on the spin bike. I'm like, I don't know if I should be doing this, but I need to move, you know, but then yeah. like you get, you get mad and like you go through like that whole all the phases. <laughs> then you're like good at getting lazy for a little bit. Cause I'm like, I can't do anything. So I might as well just hang out. Right. But, um, you know, you go through all those phases. So like going and seeing someone that actually understands that, yeah. you know, and then they're not going to be like, go rest and just ice it and you'll be okay in like a few weeks. Like, yeah. Right. No. But, How long were you down for when you got hit by a car? That one wasn't as long. Um, I just tore my pectineus, which is a small little muscle in the groin okay. and like abdominal stuff. So I was out for like four weeks because he just, and my labrum and my hip, but not getting that surgery because that's an ugly one. So that was like four weeks. Okay. And is that when you were training Ironman? That was um, before Lake Placid. Yeah. So that was before that. Mm-hmm. The one. Like five or six years ago, I shattered my um, clavicle in a bike crash too, okay. um, and that I was out for a while because I, being a PT, like I couldn't use my arm, I couldn't treat, so yeah. I was out for. It happened in August. I had the surgery, and then I wasn't back to work until end of December or so. Oh, wow. So that's when I started coming out to California. That was when uh, it it got ingrained to me coming out here, but <laughs> yeah. So I saw on your website. What is your website? It's primal. Strength. Primalstrengthpt.com. Okay. So I saw on there, uh, in your bio, something about your Ironman ranking in, like, 2015. Was it 2015? I think it was all, all it was world. was, like, top, yeah, all world. What is that? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I don't remember. I think it was, like, top 5% or 5, 10, 5 or 10% in the world for Ironman. That's, Iron Man. That's cool. So it was good. Like, that was, like, That's I was always... <laughs> 
It was like my dream was to like go to Kona. Um, you know, and that year I knew um, I got a coach. Yep. If I was going to do it, like I wanted that one shot to, you know, I, I never had run a marathon except for in Ironman. I was, oh, nice. I don't like running. I didn't like, that's why I was a goalie. I didn't like to run. Yeah. Um, but I was like, if I'm going to have to do a marathon, I'd rather swim 2.4 miles and bike 112 before I have to run the marathon, you know? Sure. Just the thought of just <laughs> yeah. the thought of I know maybe that's why, my, my, my. but um, you know got a coach went through all the training was super excited and ended up getting like hurt I don't know like a month or two before there was a couple other races I did that had a lot of sand running in it and mm-hmm. after that we had to run over some dunes and I just had this heel pain that my calf just locked up and I could not get rid of the heel pain so. Um, you know, I had an awesome race. The weather stunk that year. They pulled us out. I was already out of the water on the bike, but they pulled everyone else out because of thunder and lightning. Oh, wow. um, so part of, they didn't count the second loop of the swim. For anyone that did finish it, they took those times out. Um, you know, but I was doing well. It was a great race. Going out on, I was out in like first or second of my age group on the bike um, and then going into the run, but then you had the run. So you can okay. swim a lot faster and be done, you know, yeah. only a few minutes ahead. But then if someone runs two minutes per mile faster for a whole marathon, they're done and like hanging out for how long yeah. um, before, you know, so it was good. Um, yeah, the I, swim doesn't matter. No, so like, I, like I still, like I was out in an hour and they have like a two hour, two hours and 20 something cap, but like, yep. um, and my bike broke at mile 70. So the last, or 40. Mile 40, so I think the last 70 some miles I was on in one year. Oh, really? Yeah, I was so mad. Part of the frame broke, but I could still ride it at least. That's gonna, that she needs to go in your bio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 70 miles, like, yeah, one, I think my, my max RPMs was like 142. And the Iron Man, single speed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got my cruiser out here. Yeah, so I was like, I wanna get like redemption on the course, but I'm like, the thought of training for that again, like, yeah. The race day is just like the reward. It was all the training putting going into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a you lot. Know? So I was like, let's see if my body's even capable of handling that. So what did your training look like going into that? And you weren't crossfitting at that time. I, I right? was like, no, like I had done a figure in a bikini show, like lifting stuff like back in 2010, mm-hmm. um, gotten into the tries and then built up from like Olympic to half Ironman to Ironman. Um, but that year I had a coach who was more like old school coaching and wasn't really big on the lifting kind of stuff. Okay. So I was not lifting at all. He's like, if you want, you can add in your own little lifting routine. But I was so exhausted yeah. from like 16 hours of cardio a week. Is that what you were doing? Um, 16 hours like a week? Mondays was kind of a rest recovery day. I would just swim like an hour swim. Um, Tuesdays I would do like a swim and a run or a bike run. Wednesdays was a three hour bike mm-hmm. and like an hour run. Um, Thursdays, it's like a break workout, a break, yeah. yeah. Thursdays was like something like a, a run bike again. But like Saturdays would be a six hour bike ride, like towards the end, yeah. you know, with a little bit of a run afterwards. And Sundays would be a two or three hour run, you know? So like I was not in the mood to go do strength training, but now looking yeah. back on it, how important, I think that's part of the reason I broke down is I wasn't doing the strength training. Yeah. I mean, that's something I've noticed with running ultras. When I take strength training out, I start like running into problems and mm-hmm. I put it back in and then for whatever reason, my joints, everything. Oh, I feel I'm so good. much better. Yeah. yeah. Like, and it's even now, like if I get back into like, cause I wanted to get back in and I was going to race last year and then I had a stupid toe injury that kept me out. But, um, you know, if I start getting back just into like, cause it's all one plane, mm-hmm. you think of it, it's all running, you're all Absolutely. one plane with all that. And it's just so like, if I like find a happy balance yeah. with the lifting and the, um, endurance stuff, that's when I feel my best. So if you could go back and, and do that you would would you cut down on some of the cardio and increase the strength training or, or what would that I'd probably cut you? down and make sure it was more useful like more um, quality okay. stuff instead of sometimes just trying to get the time in mm-hmm. um, and add some of the strength training in yeah like I that's what I regret not doing I mean like I never squatted I think being a division one athlete like we didn't squat like they had us go on machines and stuff like that I mean yeah. it's all changed now there yeah. and like they have an awesome program now but back when I was there we didn't as much well, and, I think um, that was a lot of people they just didn't know back then like it's just changed yeah, yeah. 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 or yeah. even like female versus the male sports like they yeah. didn't have the girls doing all like the other stuff mm-hmm. versus you know the guys were probably doing that yeah um, every high school football team i was talking about i thought a trainer about this the other day every high school football tra- team has been doing the same bigger stronger faster shit program mm-hmm. for like decades and mm-hmm. it's just like we are yeah. so far beyond that right now yeah yeah like totally. as a as fitness community that mm-hmm. we are past this yeah we're yeah. past tricep push downs yes <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing a bodybuilding show come on <laughs> right. so do you feel like that's a common mistake for a lot of 
athletes? Like, it's or, a strengthening or is it, stuff. Or is it starting to or transition just like, over into getting some more strength into the people's Like, even programs? just runners in general. Like, how often do runners have, I mean, oh, sprinters yeah, versus, like, endurance, like, strong hips and strong glutes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's, it's usually, like, their calves are compensating. They have, like, super tight calves because they end up compensating with their, like, their feet or their calves. For what? For, for hip stability okay. or for glutes. Um, or hip flexors super tight. Think of the cyclist, too. Hip flexors super tight, you know, inhibiting or shutting down the glutes. Mm -hmm. Certain things. Like, so there's just a huge imbalances that, you know, like when you're doing that many hours and that much training, I should have been taking that much time. Like my coach was good and he's like, you need a massage at least once a week or like every couple weeks, just making sure you're staying on top of all this stuff. But there was so much other stuff I could have been doing yeah. um, that I wasn't doing um, just because, you know, if it, they're not. I mean, it's different personalities, but like I was tired, like that many hours, you For know? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that today. Yeah, and that's kind of why I'm wondering, like, would you have cut down on the cardio? And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have changed how I did that and made sure, like, almost put a priority on some of the strength training. Mm -hmm. Just even just core, like, core, like, functional training stuff. Yeah. Like, I would have kept squatting, mm -hmm. and I would have kept doing some of the other stuff. Like what? Like, so would you stick with compound lifts? Like, so for people that are into running or, or whatever, if they're looking to start strength training in addition to their endurance training... What, what would you recommend? I mean, I wouldn't want someone that hasn't been doing it to just go and start doing any kind of loaded stuff because form-wise, like, mm -hmm. I would want them to have someone to kind of even assess them because I would not want them to load something if they can't even get into good functional form because just knowing, like, what I looked like trying to, like, my first squat assessment, I was like, it was pretty ugly. And I'm like, I thought I was a decent athlete, and it wasn't that long ago that, like, yeah. my air squat was hideous, you know? Yeah. So. And you CrossFit now. I do. Okay. Um, it's only been like a year and a half, though. So. And what is your what is your opinion on CrossFit for endurance athletes? I don't have a problem with it. You know, it's gonna only it's gonna help them. You know, if they're smart about it and they go to a gym that has good coaching, that's actually gonna be like, okay, you need to like you can't be doing that with that kind of form. Yeah. You know, the other thing is you get endurance athletes. We have a mentality. You know, we're a little type A sometimes. We're a little competitive. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so then yeah. you don't want the person next to you beating you. So that's when, like, that's when we were at risk for getting hurt is, like, you know, we're super fatigued and you want to, like, beat the person next to you, mm -hmm. you know. And I've admitted I've done that. I mean, we should be in it for ourselves. But, you know, it's nice to have that push from someone else. That's what makes us push ourselves harder, too. And that's yeah. one of the most effective parts of CrossFit is... Oh, if you're working out on your own, you just won't push as hard yeah. as you will. Yeah. Knowing the person next to you might be a little ahead of you, and that just gives you that little extra push to keep going. Where in your head, if you're by yourself, you're like, eh. You know, like it's easier to talk yourself out of something when you're by yourself mm -hmm. versus, you know, they're not quitting. I'm, I'm not quitting if they're not quitting. Yeah. Kind of thing. Are there any essential lists that, let's say, let's, let's say they, their form is okay or they have someone to look at their form, so loading isn't an issue. Are there any lists that you think are essential to endurance, like squat or... Oh, I'd say squat, deadlift. Is it too hard to... You know, if they have good form, if they are if they have true good form, you know, that's only going to help build posterior chain. That's that's where everyone needs it. Yeah. I feel like how many people, they might be an endurance athlete, but then they're sitting at a desk all day yep. for work too, you know? So that's like, you're just shutting off your posterior chain and like getting super tight in your hip flexors and then you're going to go jump on a bike for how many hours, you know, we're just going to get even more tight. So yep. it's like back squat, front squat, deadlifts, like all that stuff, even just the pulling, even pull-ups, all that other stuff. You think swimming, too. All that stuff, it's going to carry over. Yeah. Yeah, I spent, like, the last two months working posterior chain specifically because in long runs, it's like I'm just noticing it breaking down. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then my quads will be smashed because they'll be compensating for so long. And yeah. on goes the problem. But. Yeah. And that's a lot of times the people that come in, like, with the knee pain half the time I see them with knee pain it's not really their knees yes their knees are working way too hard and doing way too much because the hips aren't stabilizing or the hip flexors and quads are super tight affecting how the knee cap for the patella is riding in the joint yeah. so you correct like the hips you correct the other stuff the knee pain kind of goes away mm. and sometimes you're not even really playing with the knee that much yeah but it will change uh, when runners are having low back pain I think I've been hearing that a lot like uh, recently from newer runners Mm -hmm. What do you think? Is there? Can you paint that with a broad brush? Can you kind of figure out where is that too I, naive of a question? I, a lot of times when people are having back pain, with this is just my general kind of observation, but they are in an extended position when they are running, typically like a low back arch. Uh -huh. 
Um, so like tight hip flexors, they're just leading into that, which, you know, you get into that position, like Megan was saying, tight hip flexors, tight quads, and then also combined with um, overextension of your lumbar spine, arching your back, then it's gonna, just gonna shut off the glutes even more. And so then it's making it harder. Yeah. And like one thing I kind of stress with everyone, like, cause a lot of times we know the right stretches to do. Like you're like, oh, my hip flexors are tight. I'm gonna stretch them. But like, before I, what I try to stress is why are you stretching them? Are they really tight cause they're weak? Or are they tight cause they're strong? If they're tight cause they're weak and you go and stretch them, then you're just setting yourself up to get hurt more. So your hip flexors could actually be tight and you're feeling back pain because they're weak. Mm -hmm. So your body is sensing, I don't feel safe. This isn't, they're not stable enough. So let me tighten up. Or like people with hamstrings, super tight. Like I can't touch my toes. Uh, my hamstrings are tight. Let me just, they like smash the crap out of their hamstrings all the time. Well, guess what? Like your hamstrings are tight for a reason. It's your body telling you, don't go farther. I don't feel safe. So if you could figure out the why, and that's what I'd like, it's getting outside that box. Like mm -hmm. if this is what's bothering you, it's not necessarily the problem. So I've had people that can't touch their toes and are super tight, yeah, because they they don't know how to hinge at the hips, but also you change breathing. You know, you change their breathing and all of a sudden they touch your toes. Okay. So it's like stuff like that, like you don't, it's like getting outside that box, like I said. Um, so like someone, with, a runner with back pain, think of it, you're pulling with your knees and you're driving with your hip flexors, but could it be the hip flexors are overworking because, and they're strong, but they're working too hard, or could it be the hip flexors are actually weak and tightening up because they're fatiguing and they don't have the endurance so like they might be okay the first like five, 10 miles, but then they're like, when I get to mile 13, then I start to feel this back pain. Mm -hmm. Well, is it the, maybe the glutes or hip stability is failing at that time? Or is it maybe the hip flexors are actually failing at that time and it's pulling mm -hmm. on the back. So that's like trying to test, like testing and figuring out and getting to the bottom of it instead of just telling them, go stretch your hip flexors yeah. because you might have them stretch your hip flexors and actually could do them more damage than actually good. Gotcha. And unless you know the why behind what you're feeling. So it's kind of hard. Like I would love yeah. to say, okay, this is what you're feeling. Here's, yeah. a cookie, here's a cookie cutter. Do these exercises and you're going to get better. You know, that would be easy and that would be like, that'd be great. But everyone, we're all unique. We've all had like one person might have crashed and has a certain scar that's inhibiting one thing. And another person might have the same exact symptom, but totally opposite like path and journey to get to that. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to, that's why it's like, you can kind of like generalize a lot of stuff and give them some stuff that will help decrease the symptoms, but if you actually want to get rid of the problem, yeah, that's when you out. need to get a, like a good PT that kind of looks at things, the big picture of everything. It's always a whole body approach. Yeah. And you've got to look at the whole body. Like it could be your big toe because guess what? If your big toe doesn't extend, you're going to leave the ground early and running. Yep. So if you're leaving the ground early and running, you're going to have to use your hip flexor more because you're not getting that, you're not using your glute to extend. Yeah. So if you have a really rigid first toe, you might have back pain because you're overusing your hip flexor, but it's actually coming from your big toe. What? <laughs> did, did, did I lose you on that one? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just so, my feeble mind cannot wrap around. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a big How thing. How could your like, toe be tight? So your first toe, oh, like wow. being a lot of people can't get that like extension. Your toe, your big yeah, toe? the big okay. toe. Like if you can't get that extension when you're running on push off, either you're gonna start rotating off of it, so then you start rotating. Some people you see like bunions, or you see other like. Mm just other patterns yeah. Yeah. or but if they can't get there you're going to pick your foot up early so if you pick your foot up early you're not getting that nice push off using your glutes to extend the hip okay so you're not using the glutes so it's like i don't have to work there i'm just going to use my hip flexor to pull through so you're actually pulling your leg through sooner because you're not getting that extension of that toe and what, how do you figure that out i mean that's going to be a nightmare to try to find a problem in the toe Oh, not really. I mean, you're just looking look at range of motion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So like, like, yeah, when they come in, like I'll usually have them take their socks and shoes off. So I'm looking at them. And when I have them moving, I'm looking like I've had people where you go to push and you see their, cur their toes just curl right away. And then I'll be like, oh, when you do stuff, do you like find your toes want to curl in your shoes? And they're like, oh yeah, I rub, like I get cal or you look at their toes. They all have calluses on the top knuckles. Yeah. Like they, they're a toe flexor. Like they cheat with their calves and their toe flexors for something else in that whole back line. Mm. And do you think that some of the technology that goes into shoes now could be causing some of that? Or do you think that... Well... Yeah, that could be a whole another... Uh, yeah. Like, we just... I mean, think about... Okay, so high heels for yeah. women. 
or even all of the shoes that have these really narrow like toe boxes mm-hmm. and what Megan was just talking about with the the bunions and stuff where that that big toe kind of goes towards your other toes so it kind of angles inwards I mean that's all these small toe boxes are kind of almost encouraging that they're not encouraging you to actually have like proper mechanics of your of your toes Especially, I mean, just even with walking. That doesn't even, that's not even yeah, going into put, running shoes or anything put, like that. We put shoes on and then we don't use our intrinsics in our feet that much anymore. Like, think of the dexterity we have in our hands. We yeah. should have that in our toes. Like, I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I cannot isolate and move each of my toes. Like, we do our fingers. Yeah. We should be able to do that with our toes. Mm. But really? we put shoes on and we just move them. We, <laughs> as we sit here and try. <laughs> like, if I hold them down, I can get the other one to go, but the other right. ones are like trying. We should be able to do that, but we lose it. We put we just put shoes on all the time, and you know there's so much sensory input. Like yeah. a lot of times before you work out, just roll the arch of your foots out with like a lacrosse or a golf ball. Yeah. That wakes up so much stuff. Mm. Like it, it could change any like and some like Dr. Perry and stuff like that. He always mm-hmm. talks about he's like tape the bottom of your foot. Like use that rock tape. Just put a piece that tactile input there. You know wakes up so much stuff. Mm-hmm. You put it across the, the bottom whole of your foot. foot. Yeah. yeah, just like a strip just right, here, right across the okay. foot. Yeah. yeah. And that helps wake up that sensory input. I mean, it's just giving that tactile input to that stuff. But, I mean, everyone's unique and different. And, like, some people, if they usually cheat with their toes and their feet, like, you could, like, you hope you're not feeding into that dysfunction. But, like, there's just so much there, you know? We've talked about it on the show before, like, and when, you know, you go to a running store and they'll watch you run and then they Mm -hmm. give you a shoe based on how you run (laughs) instead of changing how you run. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like... That the whole, you know, I think it's probably Nike contributed more to that than anybody, but the whole, like, trying to make your shoe fit how you move instead of the other way around. Mm-hmm. Like, you must probably get a lot of that, trying to undo that. And then there's the whole thing of that you wanted more arch support, and then you wanted less arch support. You know, right. you want to actually, like, you don't want to, like, it's like when you tell someone, like, to put a back brace on when you're doing stuff. Like, you put the back brace on, and then people are depending on the brace, so you're not actually using your core. Or, like, you end up giving, like, putting the ankle brace on or putting the arch in, so then you your foot just stays there. You don't actually have to use your intrinsics to help stabilize. So it all depends. And then, and then just talking about kind of the, the CrossFit world, you have a lot of people that have maybe worn these really high arch shirt shoes with a lot of support, like your whole, you know, athletic career or whatever. And then now, like, they're trying to get into a Nano or the uh, Metcon, the Nike yeah. Metcon or something like that. Totally different shoe, but of course they're buying it because, you know, that's the cool thing to do. Yep. And, like, it's destroying their whole, and nothing against, like, a shoe or whatever, but there was no, like, addressing what was maybe mm-hmm. causing um, the issues them going into that shoe and I admit so. it like being an like I wouldn't say X but it is an X triathlete right now because I'm not racing right now <laughs> but um like I compensate with my calves you can say retired yeah no I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm coming out of retirement this year um but like I compensate when I squat I feel my toes curl at times and that's something that I battle with is like I compensate like when I two years ago when I was racing I had to stop mm-hmm. even like for a sprint try because I thought my calves were going to explode I'm like do I have compartment syndrome or something yeah it was more it was my calves were cheating and my mm-hmm. feet were like over compensating for other stuff mm-hmm. but like I'm guilty of it I'll look at the workout and I, that will help me decide what shoes I put on you know, sure. or if I'm going to put a little heel lift in my sneakers <laughs> because I know we have thrusters and I know my form so much better if I want to have thrusters and box jumps and something else. Like yeah. I want to, I don't want to wear my lifters, but I also don't want to be doing something with horrible form, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and I feel like, cause that's my limitation and I'm working on it, but I also will just put like, we had a little ortho, a little like yeah. heel cup in my shoe because that's, I usually, I get heel pain cause with my calves being so tight, you know, it pulls on my heel. Mm-hmm. That's so. like uh, when Born to Run came out, and then everybody went out and bought five fingers and ran 10K and immediately thrashed their... Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. You're not ready right. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so I see you putting out a lot of things um, right now as of this recording where we four of the CrossFit Open. Yes. So I see you putting out things beforehand uh, once they release the workout as far as prehab things that you can do before the workout. Are there things like that for endurance that you that you would recommend, or does it really like if you're gonna run? Are there things that you should do other than just dynamic stretching? And like I always say, a lot of us know the right thing to do. Like a lot of us would be like, oh, my hips are tight. 
but it's also like the why. So I find like a lot of my clients, if we can pair the things and do them in the right order. So if like, say we're hanging out and we're just like rolling out or doing whatever, and you're like talking to someone else. And then next thing you know, it's like three or four minutes later. And then you're like, oh, I'm going to just do a little hip activation stuff before I go. Like you kind of lost that window. It's kind of, if you do some kind of soft tissue, you kind of have 30 to 60 seconds from when you do that soft tissue that you opened up a window in the brain to learn something that you want to fire up the opposing, like say if it was hip flexors, we're kind of cheating for your glutes. Yes, roll out, stretch your hip flexors, and then right away turn over and do some kind of glute activation. So if you can pair the like exercises and the stretches together properly, you'll see a big difference in like, so say for a runner, if it's their calves were cheating for like, Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of their problems with their hips or something like do your calf stretch, roll out your calves and then activate your glutes. You know, if that's the issue or your core, open up your hips, do like some dynamic walking lunges, but also get in there and do some like sidestepping or something to help with your hip. And you what, know. what is the physiologically, why are you doing that? Like what? It's, it's like a corrective exercise. It's like, it's, it's basically repatterning in, your brain, um, in the you brain. Are open to that input so if you're doing so if you're trying to like so if your calves were the ones that were cheating for something by going in and stretching and releasing the calves you're like telling the brain you know like calm this down right now and then fire up what needs to work to get that activated so sometimes it's the pairing and the order that we do things in if we're not doing them properly we miss that window to really like when things get better but it's not sticking or like it gets better then it kind of goes away it gets better like to get things to really stick, sometimes it's just the order and the timing yeah. of the exercise. Okay. It's That'll like, make a big difference. Yeah, it's like a lot of people that maybe have an injury or something like that, and they'll they oh yeah, why well, I foam rolled or I did the lacrosse ball work or I maybe I even got a massage. It feels so good for like a little bit, and then once I go back to squatting, it it just hurts again or something like that. And so it's there's usually like Megan was saying, there's usually like a, a combination of things. Like there needs to be some releasing or some inhibition of, of some area mm -hmm. and then also some activation or some kind of work yeah. like in combination so, okay yeah nice uh, so you're doing the open i am how's it going it's going well yeah so we'll you see. can brag on yourself no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well now that i'm masters it's great that i don't have to go against all the kids anymore because i'm 35 to 39 okay. so you can actually like last year was my first open i just started crossfit um, and I forgot to put a score in, so I didn't even get to see like where I ranked oh, or whatever. Okay. But this is the first year like really doing it. So I'm doing well. So they take the top 200, I guess, for the online qualifier. And so there's one more workout and, if, you know, hopefully it's a good one. All and goes well, uh, goes well. I'm sitting like right around 200 right now. So, so how does that work? Because then for Masters, the regionals is online as well, isn't it? Yeah, so, it's a, um, so they don't do it by region at all. It's just top 200 in the world. For your age group? Yeah, to be part of the regional. No, just an online an online the qualifier. Next. Yeah, okay. the next phase. And I think it's like another four workouts or something like that. Yeah. And you have to record yeah. it and then submit it in. Is so, that like directly following the open? Or does that, do you guys have I think the rest? dates are on the website. I forget. But there's a oh, little okay. bit of time. But it's funny. Like, so Sam Briggs, she's in my age group. You know? <laughs> like all the original, like, oh, yeah. all the original yeah. girls. 35 to 39 so it's like no sure. joke thinking like oh you're masters like I look at some of their scores and they're just like crushing it I'm like <laughs> yeah one day no. awesome. <laughs> so it's fun to see like going against them but it's also fun to see like just in your age group yeah you know yeah, yeah cool so after after the, the online qualifiers with the top 200 what do they do after that are I think you, it's top have... 15 or top 20 then okay. from the online qualifier top okay. 20 I think go to the games oh okay Cool. Yeah. I wonder if they make the that next qualifier like heavier, typically like they do in regionals. Yeah, or yeah, it would be heavier and a little harder. Like yeah. so I feel like to try to some of the stuff people. like they wouldn't yeah. put right in, and I think judging wise too, they wouldn't put some of them in the open just because yeah. it's harder to, you know, yeah. judge for some of the stuff. But. So coming from an endurance background, what's better for you? Or is it super long like twenty minute workouts? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you'd rather not do the heavy stuff. You'd rather do the more Matt Coney. Um, I don't mind the heavy. Like, I, I wouldn't say I'm super, super strong. I'm still new. I didn't start squatting until a year and a half ago. But you're super strong overhead. Yeah, if you just give me something to lock out overhead, I'm great. Sometimes just getting it there, though. If I had to do a full squat clean to get it there, no. Power clean, yes. <laughs> My numbers are a little backwards. But, um... That happens. 
move. <laughs> yeah. No, but like a long workout, like I feel like I finally get in my groove and then by the end I'm like speeding up or give me yeah. just like a long row or something. Like add, the, but they had row in this one, so. Yeah, but when you get someone like Sam Briggs who just. <laughs> oh, she just go forever. Well, I don't have to worry. Yeah. 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 I'm nowhere so near that. I think she was athlete yeah. too before. <sighs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when the open comes around, you stopped doing CrossFit, what, two years ago, Clyde? Uh, no, only like a year ago. Oh, when the open comes around, do you wish you still did it? No. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I would like stress myself. I remember having anxiety like on Thursday, like, oh my gosh, I can't see mm-hmm. this time very, like, or whatever time the time. Oh, yeah. Of, and then like immediately like checking your phone like every five minutes throughout the entire So like, even though like weekend. checking it now, it's five o'clock, <laughs> but by tomorrow morning, it's still going to drop more, like knowing other scores got right. put in. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. yes, I've had dreams in the past few weeks about what the workouts are going to be. Oh, yeah, it's ridiculous. I'm like, really? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so it's like my only second full open, so. Yeah. yeah. Last year was my it's first expected. time not doing it in, like, I don't know, a long time. Yeah, and it was like I walked yeah. into the gym on Friday with, like, out of care in the world, and I see everyone, like, stressing Stress, out yeah. and, like, working on technique and going over shit on the whiteboard, and I'm like... I'm not just gonna me. Go over here and squat. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the bench I did, what, today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's why I, I miss. That's what I miss right now, though, is because doing this, like the redos, I mm-hmm. miss my normal training routine. Yeah, like, that. It I just want to get back like, your programming. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it wrecks Jim's ability to program too, mm-hmm. because you don't everyone's give coming anything, in and redoing, like, especially with a smaller anything. gym. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. You don't want to give anything like too challenging that's going to make everyone so sore or someone that's going to like they're all going to rip their hands open you know i redid 17 what was it two with the bar muscle ups that one i did read that three times i had like bruises on my ribs like i taped up my ribs with pads on the last time through (laughs) because i'm like i need to get these reps yeah well it wasn't that right after right before chest to bar right it was uh that was the third one chest bar and snatch complex yeah Yeah. so they weren't back to back they they were right they were Yeah. yeah yeah it's just like people that did it two or three times on each one it's like Oh yeah, you just hands were just wrecked. Yeah. Oh, my exactly. grips were awesome, so it was great. So you, you said that you you mentioned you're really good overhead. Do you do a lot of midline stability work in your programming, or is that just like a natural? In your um, I would think my midline is actually one of my weaker parts for some reason. Like I have trouble if I had to get up on like for the rings, mm-hmm. like I lose my midline. Um, for even just bar muscle ups, I lose my midline with stuff. But if I have something locked out overhead, I can hold it. For days. I don't know why it Public is. positioning, right? That, and I was a gymnast when I was younger. Okay. You know, like I could walk on my hands, no problem. If you give me like a plate or something, we, we used to do it in Hoboken back in Jersey, we'd have to do a whole, like a lap around the block holding like 45s over our head, yeah. you know, and I could make it all the way around, no problem holding it up. But, you know, if I had give me like reps or something, yeah. then it's like the, the range in here, like yeah. the other ranges that I have issues with. But if I'm locked out overhead... I, I noticed that in my own training, like once I, I had, I got a lot, I could do a lot more weight and I didn't get stronger and it was because I, I, I opened those joints up and I got, I gained the ability to like really stack joints on top of each other yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and it like makes the world a difference. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, so I could hold it, like I could, what it was like three plus minutes the handstand hold, but then if I, I, I have trouble doing one strict handstand push up, mm. oh. you know? So it's like, it depends on the range where I'm at. So it's just now, like, I mean, these are all new things for me, too, being a year yeah, and a half. Exactly. So I'm You're finding all my weaknesses of, like, okay, I have a big list now. It's kind of yeah. fun because you still see, like, the big improvements when it's still, like, something that's new, too. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, that'd be, you going to go to the games this year? We're going to see you with Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> Treating yeah. the athletes? <laughs> I think we're going to be there. I think we're going to have a booth there this year. Nice. But, so, um, is there anything, anything, uh, else where can people kind of follow along or, or support what you're doing or um, if you're on Instagram it's primal strength doc or on um, you know there's just a cover website I have a website in the works so it's just primal strength PT mm-hmm. like com. yeah that, so. so it has like my email on there and also my phone number so if anyone has any questions you know shoot me an email and you um, treat in Carlsbad so I'm up offshore CrossFit up in Carlsbad okay. um, I kind of do like a mobile oh, PT too Mudo, is that your gym? Mm-hmm. Jess. Jeff. Jess. Jess Mudo's up there. Jess Mudo. Yes, okay. she's up there, and Jason and uh, Joe. Yep. And then kind of doing a mobile stuff too. So okay. I do travel around a little bit depending on where. Um, and then I'm down here at Movement RX treating here Mondays and Thursdays right now. Great. In Instagram, that's where you post those. Uh, 
I think that's where I've seen the mm -hmm. pre-open, like people yes. are getting ready to do the open. A little video or a little pointers on uh, certain exercises yeah. that would really benefit. Usually they're like some of the relationships I find, so kind of pairing things together where sometimes you see some of the, the prep stuff is like, oh, you have to open up your shoulders, but also open up the shoulders and then fire something up mm -hmm. afterwards. Totally. So I try totally. to give like a little pair, a pairing of like common relationships that usually makes a big difference. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for being on. Thank you for having me. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to Lionheart Radio. Subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating for all of your supplement needs. And for show notes, visit luavive.com.